Ignition sequence start. Good morning, and welcome to this peek inside the International Space Station Flight Control Room at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. These men and women are monitoring the systems on the orbiting station and assisting the Expedition 64 crew members as they wrap up another full week of supporting scientific research in space. Commander Sergei Rizikov and his American, Russian, and Japanese crewmates are looking forward to an off-duty weekend before the crew of Resilience suits up for a first-of-its-kind relocation of this commercial crew vehicle from one docking port to another. Houston Station on Space to Ground. Welcome to Space to Ground, I'm Asid Reyna. This week we celebrate science aboard the International Space Station. NASA's Stratospheric Aerosol and Gas Experiment 3, or SAGE-3, celebrated its fourth anniversary of its first light measurements aboard the International Space Station. This experiment is the most recent in a series of SAGE instruments that have measured stratospheric gases and aerosols from space. Launched this station in February of 2017, SAGE-3 is helping scientists monitor the recovery of ozone, resulting from the reduction in emissions of ozone-depleting substances. SAGE-3 has also measured the intrusion of aerosols in the stratosphere from intense wildfires in Australia and California and from volcanic eruptions. The SAGE family of instruments started in 1979 and is one of NASA's longest-running Earth-observing programs. Data from SAGE-2 helped confirm human-driven changes to the ozone layer, which contributed to the 1987 Montreal Protocol that banned some of the most destructive industrially produced ozone-depleting chemicals. NASA's SpaceX Crew-1 astronauts aboard the space station will mark another first for commercial spaceflight on April the 5th, when the four astronauts will relocate the Crew Dragon spacecraft. NASA astronauts Michael Hopkins, Victor Glover, and Shannon Walker, along with JAXA astronaut Soichi Noguchi, will undock Crew Dragon resilience from the forward port of the station's Harmony module and dock to the space-facing port. This will be the first port relocation of a Crew Dragon spacecraft. The relocation will free Harmony's forward port for the docking of the Crew Dragon Endeavour, set to carry four crew members to the station on NASA's SpaceX Crew-2 mission. The Crew-1 astronauts are scheduled to depart to the station and return to Earth on April the 28th, leaving the space-facing port of Harmony vacant. A Dragon cargo spacecraft carrying several tons of supplies and the first set of the new solar arrays for the space station is scheduled to launch this summer and requires the space-facing port position to enable robotic extraction of the arrays from Dragon's trunk using Canadarm2. Live coverage will begin at 6 a.m. Eastern on NASA television, the NASA app, and the agency's website. Station, this is Dr. Francis Collins with National Institutes of Health. How do you hear me? During a recent in-flight conversation, NASA astronaut and microbiologist Dr. Kate Rubens had an opportunity to talk to one of her science heroes, Dr. Francis Collins, director of the National Institutes of Health. You're doing great work up there. and We're all fascinated uh, by the way in which uh, science is being conducted right there on the International Space Station. And I hope people are watching this, uh, dreaming a little bit themselves, uh, could imagine doing something like this. It's a path forward. This is the best time, tell me if you agree, to be a scientist in the history of the planet because so many things are possible. Not only is this an exciting general time uh, in the space station history, I'm having fun actually today, right now. Uh, there's just, there's a lot going on up here. And I really do think that science is an incredible career, whether you're doing it in space or on the ground. If people are interested in this, the pleasure and, and the gratification of being a scientist every day, it's, it's truly amazing to get up and discover new things. That's Space to Ground this week. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. In their time living and working on the International Space Station, the astronauts who arrived on the Crew-1 spacecraft have gotten into the routines of the mission. They've done spacewalks. They're about to take a trip around the neighborhood. Well, let's go behind the official biographies and let these astronauts reveal a few inner truths about their favorite foods, the hardest part of training, and what is still on their space career bucket list. Steak. Anything with lots of zip. Sushi. Princess Bride. Star Wars. 
the replacement. I like quirky movies. I'll go with Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? The Moonwalk. I like salsa dancing. Ah, uh, spring. Always spring. Spring. I like places where you don't really have seasons, but I guess living in California, like going to college in San Luis Obispo, it felt like spring all the time, so maybe that's what I, I guess I like spring. <laughs> a good wedge of Parmesan cheese. Yogurt. Greek yogurt. Uh, let's see, ranch dressing, that's a kid thing. Tea. Ugh. Tea, of course. Tea. Coffee. Wastefulness. Pet peeves. Uh, people who don't use turn signal. Come on, is this so difficult? Now be patient. Don't be afraid, be bold. Smile more. Spend the day on more. <laughs> so I'd probably run around and take lots of pictures. Sun dune driving. Hey, you're on Mars, that's, that's good enough. Don't worry, be happy. I believe I can fly. I don't know, that just comes to mind. Ooh, that's a tough one, Russian language. Physically, it's uh, spacewalk training, and mentally, it's Russian language. Leonardo da Vinci. Frederick Douglass. And I don't know, actually. How about that? Dark chocolate. Sleeping during media. I get to do so many amazing things in my life. When I have the time and can afford to do nothing, I really like to do nothing. Oh, parent, by far. Being a parent. Parent, hands down. Hopper. Ike. It's an acronym, stands for I Know Everything. It's a reminder to never pass up a good opportunity to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Walking on the moon. To work on the surface of the moon. That, that's a, a dream, absolutely. Uh, I want to spend a single day without any calendar events. An officer in the United States Air Force. Therapist. I'm good at listening to other persons uh, talk, believe me. I'd still be flying. But the other thing I loved doing was working with students. I, being in a classroom is one of the most meaningful things I've ever done, even to this day. Karaoke. Anything with my family. If I could fly more, I would fly more. Uh, commander of time machine. Uh, so the kids say it should be telekinesis, but I think to fly. Teleportation. To fly. I think we have a trend here. I got a sweet tooth. Probably Mexican food or Indian food. Or maybe Thai food. Good question. I would say Moroccan and Indian. Favorite decade? Wow. <laughs> Favorite decade right now. 80s? Because the 80s. Uh, 1980s? Because I was young and stupid in that order. <laughs> The astronauts of resilience, like their crewmates who traveled on a Soyuz spacecraft, spend some of their time working on science experiments that take advantage of the absence of gravity, such as when astronaut Doug Hurley squeezed a bag of fruit punch. The fluid that squirted out of the bag wound down a clear tube and soaked into a block of white foam, all to provide researchers with better information about how to manage liquids in microgravity. Mark, station on three, how do you hear? This is Doug. Doug, I got you five by five. We started maybe 15 years ago in this long line of experiments that um, have been going to space that are all small scale fluids experiments that have really taught us a lot about uh, managing fluids in space without any moving parts, without any electricity, just fluidics. Now we can apply research results that we've learned from doing experiments in space to actual space systems that actually require gravity to be gone for them to work. That's different. That's a new horizon, I would say. Okay, Mark, ready on step four. This is an engineering demonstration of a wastewater purification system. So inside that foam, there are all these weird channels and, and different wetting foams in there such that capillary forces wick the liquids out, opening the channels up. So it's a capillary solution to an engineering problem of managing brine and contaminated uh, water streams. 
Yeah, it sounds really, uh, really interesting and uh, frankly, really cool. I can't wait to see what it does. What you're going to do is you're going to open that little valve out of the drink bag and you're going to prime the tube. Then you're going to squeeze that bag, the drink bag, and then kind of in about 15 seconds, fill the entire foam with the contents of the bag. The interior piece of that foam is highly wetting, so it wants to suck up that water. And, but then there are pieces on the outside that are hydrophobic, so it doesn't want the water to penetrate through. So how can we you know, mix that up? What are the issues? What does that look like? Because ultimately this piece of technology, even though it's so simple as a piece of foam, it can potentially do so many things. If you watch the videos, you see it, you're gonna think it's dull and what are these goofs doing? <laughs> you know, you're gonna say that. But basically what it is, is it's a dyed liquid. It's actually red fruit punch that we use, which is a simulant for urine. Do you like the backlight view? Yeah, we're geeking out over that. It gives us the complete view of this whole thing. It's nice. That's yeah, pretty cool. So the purpose of this experiment is to see how well does the foam hold the liquid in microgravity and if we completely agitate it and really put this piece of equipment through the ringer, how well does it bounce back? Honestly, the most surprising thing that's come out of it is how simple we can make this technology. Maybe the foam project is going to enable a backup system for the toilets, or maybe it's gonna be a new wastewater processing system altogether, and that's just the future. It's just, I mean, it, it feels like anything is really possible. We are very hopeful that our work, which started out in fundamental research and is turned more and more applied, could actually get to the point where it's delivering on equipment. Equipment that functions without moving parts, or a minimum of moving parts, without power, without noise. We'd love it to have a system that just works passively by its shape. And whether it's on the moon or in orbit around the moon or in way to Mars, we'd love to contribute in that way and in the way that makes others able to do that too. So by publishing the design laws, by the design experience, by the experiment experience, we'd love to do that too. I think it's just cool. It's so simple and it's so cool. Its position 250 miles above the Earth makes the International Space Station a great place to gather information about this planet. This one, right here. There is an instrument on board that gathers information about how plants on Earth sweat, and that provides data to scientists who are monitoring the health of Earth's vegetation. Sweating can be cool. Presented by Science at NASA. Did you ever notice how the air can seem cooler when you enter a forest? Humans aren't the only living things that sweat to cool off. When trees and plants sweat, they cool themselves and can cool the surrounding air. Through a process called transpiration, water and nutrients are taken up by plant roots from soil and delivered to the stem and leaves as part of photosynthesis. Some of the water drawn up through the roots exits the plants through pores or stomata in its leaves, hence the sweating. As this sweat evaporates, heat is removed from the air, providing a cooling effect. However, if there isn't enough water available or relative humidity gets too high, the stomata close. The plant heats up, ceases to grow, and can eventually die. Healthy plants provide a number of ecosystem services to humans, including food, recreation, and building materials. Plants also impact Earth's global water and carbon cycles, with plant transpiration accounting for around 10% of the moisture in our atmosphere. A new NASA mission called EcoStress, short for Ecosystem Spaceborne Thermal Radiometer Experiment on Space Station, was successfully launched to the International Space Station on June 29, 2018. EcoStress will literally study how plants sweat, providing the most detailed measurements of plant temperatures available from space and helping researchers monitor the health of Earth's vegetation. Your temperature is one of the first things a doctor wants to know when you go for a checkup, says Simon Hook, EcoStress principal investigator from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. It tells your doctor a lot about your condition, 
temperature is an extremely useful indicator for plants too. Temperature data can indicate if a plant is stressed and needs more water before the plant collapses, providing an early warning of a possible drought, explains Hook. EcoStress will be able to measure plant temperatures and therefore plant health over areas as small as an individual field of crops. The International Space Station is well suited for the EcoStress mission. Hook says, most Earth observing satellites are in a sun synchronous orbit, so they pass over an area at the same time each day, providing us a daily snapshot of that area. Because of the space station's orbit, EcoStress sees the same spot on Earth every few days at different times of day, so it can track changes throughout a typical day. If, during a hot, dry afternoon, plants stop releasing water to conserve supplies, EcoStress will see a change in temperature compared with previous measurements of the same area. It will detect these kinds of responses in farmers' fields and other ecosystems. Data acquired from EcoStress may, in time, help farmers develop crop watering protocols, give researchers a clearer understanding of the effects of drought, and assist water resource managers in planning effective water use. Its data could also reveal the effects of droughts on natural vegetation. For example, to help identify vulnerable types of trees. Forest managers and ecologists will be able to use this information to make better informed decisions. But that's not all. Eco-stress temperature data will be useful in a whole host of ways, says Hook. We'll be able to use the same techniques developed to extract plant temperature to look at other phenomena such as the temperature of volcanoes, urban heat waves, wildfires, coastal currents, lakes, and more. That's a whole story in itself. Want to learn more about this cool mission? No sweat. Just visit science.nasa.gov. The exterior of the International Space Station is home to many ongoing experiments. The one Isidro mentioned a few minutes ago is a third-generation investigation into the state of the ozone layer of Earth's atmosphere. The Stratospheric Aerosol and Gas Experiment has now spent four years measuring the ozone, aerosols, and other components of the atmosphere for scientists who hope to see an improvement in the atmosphere's ability to protect the planet and everyone and everything on it from harmful ultraviolet radiation. SAGE stands for Stratospheric Aerosol and Gas Experiment. It's the third generation, so we call it SAGE-3. What it does is it looks at ozone, um, water vapor, aerosols in the atmosphere using a solar occultation technique. So it locks onto the sun or the moon and it tracks that as it does, as it rises through the atmosphere or sets through the atmosphere of the planet so that we can get vertical pro profiles of those gases. More specifically, it's ozone that we're really tracking. We hope to see recovering ozone throughout the entire stratosphere. So, and you know, ozone is very important. It protects us from the UV radiation. Without that protection, we would have lower tr crop yields. You know, our plants really don't like UV radiation, and we would have problems too. We would have more skin cancers and cataracts. So, we really need that ozone layer in the stratosphere to protect us. I've been working on this for 20 years now, and it's it's. It's going to be amazing to watch it up there and, you know, get up there and watch the data coming down. Another major goal of the International Space Station is to help us learn what we need to know to support future space exploration, such as working out the systems of new spaceships to support the human needs of the astronauts on long journeys to deep space. That would include systems to provide clean water. In this installment of the demonstration video series, astronaut Drew Feustel discusses the water recovery system used to recycle crew wastewater for consumption. Hi, I'm NASA astronaut Drew Foistel. Welcome to the International Space Station. On our station, our water recovery system is vital to our mission and our survival. Want to know why and how we recycle and filter our water? Let's go. We use water recovery and filtration because it is expensive to launch resupply missions. 
and the weight of the water is a problem as well. Think about the weight of a single bucket of water. Can you imagine the weight of water for a month's supply for six people on the International Space Station? What about the water for a year or more when we leave low Earth orbit for deeper space missions? That's a lot of water, and bringing it with us is not very efficient. On station, we recycle wastewater to get fresh drinking water. This recovery and filtration process includes our urine, moisture we exhale, and sweat, along with the water we use to bathe and shave. It works like this. When we use the bathroom, urine is collected and pumped to a distillation assembly. The assembly spins, pulling the urine to its walls. The urine is heated to evaporate water from the waste and then condensed in the outer chamber to form distillate. Next, the water is pumped to a tank where it is joined with the water recovered from cabin air created by crew sweat and respiration. Down the line from there, odors and any other contaminants are removed with heat. Then iodine is added for microbial control. Our water is checked often to ensure it meets water quality requirements. It is also monitored closely for bacteria, pollutants, and proper pH. The pH scale ranges from 0 to 14 and is a tool used by scientists to measure the strength of an acid or base. Our water is required to be in the 6.0 to 8.5 range. The end result of the entire process is clean drinking water that we get to enjoy every day. The recycled water on the space station is sterile. There's no odor or bad taste. You've seen that water recycling is critical for long duration missions such as here on the space station and will be for future trips to the moon or Mars. Be sure to check out the activity connected to this video so you can learn more about water filtration. Thanks for learning with me and I'll see you next time. As you'd imagine, performing science research on the ground can be very different than performing it in space, and many International Space Station crew members who spend time working up there come away feeling like they have undergone a profound change. Former astronaut Jack Fisher is one of them. Here he recalls his time in orbit and discusses how the spirit of exploration contributes to humanity's future. The bug for space really bit me when I came down to visit my grandpa down here in Houston. So I saw the big old Saturn V rocket sitting on its belly out there and, and just thought, man, if, if humanity can do something this amazing, this awesome, I want to be a part of it. And I just fell more in love with the idea of space and, and being a part of something bigger than myself. The thought of actually getting to space, I couldn't wrap my head around that. You walk up to this, this rocket that's covered in frost from the cold fuel inside and, and it's creaking and groaning and kind of alive and, and you're like, well, that's pretty cool, but uh, they're probably gonna cancel. It's, probably, it's just not gonna happen. You know, I've done so many sims and it, it just can't be real. There's no way I'm gonna go to space. But then when, when no kidding, it, it, it lights off and you feel the rumble and then you start to move and, and that kind of just constant smooth acceleration, uh, pulling you back in the seat, everything comes to life on the panels. You see all the things that you've seen a hundred times in Sims. In one instant, all of that that I felt was unimaginable became real and it was just, it was a magical thing I'll just never forget. You know, we're scientists and engineers and pilots and doctors, we're not poets, but we sure try to be because you want to share as best you can the experience um, that, that you've seen and felt. I think I told my wife, uh, 
uh, on our once I got on board that I thought it was a it's a burrito of awesomeness smothered in awesome sauce baby it's so beautiful it was just the beauty of being there yourself with your own eyes and seeing it One thing that, that I would love to do while on orbit was there was a, a window in one of the Russian modules that looked kind of out the back of the station. And I'd go sit there. I'd turn off everything and you could get it really dark in there, uh, let my eyes adjust and just look out at the stars. And the stars, you know, the longer you sit, the more you see. And it just, it becomes unbelievable the number, the just billions of stars, the Magellanic clouds, the galaxies that you can see with your naked eye. And they don't twinkle. They just stare at you. They dare you to come and to, to explore. It lights a fire inside your soul that is, is unlike anything I ever experienced before or since. And it's why you see astronauts you know, they say 560, 580, I don't know how many people have gone to space. They're all the same. They all have that bug. And they all want to do everything in their power after experiencing that to make sure that humanity reaches its potential, that we get there, that we don't just see the stars, that we explore them, that we live there, that we grow into what we can be. And you're reminded of the incredible potential that we have as humans when we put everything else aside and just work together. And you feel a part of that, uh, looking out the cupola and just being a part of thousands of people from across this globe that have put together this just palace in the sky for us to discover and learn and grow. It showed me the potential of what humanity can be when you work together as one team. It inspired me uh, to do everything I can in my power for the rest of my life to enable humanity to evolve, to get there, to those stars that were staring straight in my face and daring us to come, come get them. Uh, that is something that you can never quench. It's been a couple years since I flew. Uh, and that fire still burns just as strong today as it, as it will when I die. If you want another look at any of the stories we feature today, you can always find them on YouTube and Facebook, where you'll also find a lot of other great features on a variety of NASA topics. Be sure to look around. If you are looking for good conversation about human spaceflight, then check out Houston We Have a Podcast, a weekly show talking to folks involved in all areas of space exploration. Today is your chance to listen in on the insiders discussing International Space Station science, as our third Space Station anniversary panel discussion focuses on some of the outstanding research efforts and the things we've already learned from experiments on this platform. Go to nasa.gov slash podcasts for this week's episode and all our previous episodes and the full library of all the NASA podcasts, which are also on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and SoundCloud.